Hello, everyone, and welcome. I hope that you and your families are staying safe and healthy during this time. My name is Mike Bonner. I'm the head of Canadian business banking at BMO. And on the line, we have close to 200 clients from Eastern Ontario, Quebec, and Atlantic regions, as well as a number of our BMO business banking colleagues. I want to extend a special welcome and thanks to Doug Porter, BMO's chief economist. And you'll hear, you'll hear from Doug momentarily. And another introduction, we have on the line Rob McLean. And Rob is our head of business banking for Central Ontario. So Rob will conduct and, and carry on in a little bit. Look, I know that this is a busy time for everyone. And I want to thank you for making time for what I think will be a very, very valuable conversation. It's almost been one year since COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic. And over the course of the year, our world has changed in many, many unpredictable ways. Lives have been lost. Workers have been displaced. And big parts of our economy, frankly, have been grounded to a halt. Each of you has been impacted in different ways. And our team of bankers have been working very closely with our clients, often, honestly, around the clock to provide support, introduction of programs, and frankly, just to make sure that all of our clients are aware and taking advantage of any relief, from SEBA to the BCAP programs to the recent HASCAP program. We want to ensure that you receive the support and the information that you need to keep the anxiety, stress, and op op operational and to keep the doors open. There's no doubt in any of our minds that small businesses are the engine of the Canadian economy, and our success at BMO depends completely on the ability to get close to our clients. We see ourselves as your long-term partners. We're on this journey with you through the good times, and I think even more importantly, through the hard times. And the road to recovery, it's still being mapped. There's a tremendous amount of underlying optimism for 2021. We have vaccines on the horizon, as well as some pent-up demand for services. When you consider that on top of a recovering global economy, this gives us a lot of hope as we look forward. Today, <clears throat> our goal is to share some insights, and Doug will give us a full view on that, on what's happening and how it's impacting our economy and perhaps your business. We'll then open the floor to some questions. Many of you have already submitted questions in advance and we'll guide through a moderated Q&A session. First of all, just thank you for trusting us with your business. Thank you for your relationship and for spending some time in making today a priority. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Doug. Well, thank you very much, Mike, and uh, good morning, everyone. I uh, share the uh, the welcome to, to everyone for uh, joining us here today. Uh, so what I plan on doing is basically walking through a short uh, presentation of about 15 slides or so over the next uh, 20 to, th to 30 minutes. And then, as Mike indicated, we're going to open it up for, for questions, uh, which uh, many of you have uh, graciously sent in uh, ahead of time. Uh, so. Uh, to, to begin, I, I would say overall, we are relatively optimistic on the economic outlook. Uh, actually, just yesterday, we upgraded our view on uh, on the Canadian economy. Um, but I do have to start off with uh, with COVID, as much as this uh, this does pay me, um, and I'm sure you're all very tired of hearing about the uh, the pandemic, but there is some very good news here on, on this front. Uh, the chart in front of us looks at the number of new cases. It's an average over the uh, the past seven days. And it compares uh, Canada, the US and Europe, uh, the big European economies. It's close to being on a per capita basis. So it is relatively comparable. And I think the big story here is after peaking in early or mid middle January, it does look like uh, the, the second wave really has crested and the, the number of new cases has come down quite aggressively. You know, of course, uh, we've had head fakes before. For instance, in Europe, we, you know, we saw the number of new cases uh, decline a lot late last year. We thought of, the second wave was over and then it picked back up again. So it's it's probably just a little bit too early to let our, our guard down, but certainly there is uh, there is some good news on that front. Of course, uh, the big concern among officials now is, uh, as, as I indicated on the on the bullets, uh, the potential for some of the new variants to, uh, to lead to uh, even a third wave. Of course, the other good news at the same time is, uh, is that we are starting to see the vaccine rolled, uh, vaccines rolled out in a much more uh, rapid fashion in, in recent days. And, you know, despite a lot of complaints, for instance, in the U.S., uh, the number of vaccinations there has uh, picked up quite considerably in recent days. They're now vaccinating more than one and a half million people per day. 
Uh, the number of doses distributed is now over 20 per every 100 persons in the, in the U.S. Uh, you can see it's even a little bit higher in the uh, in the U.K. Here in Canada too, yes, we've uh, we've trailed behind, uh, but it does look like it's going to pick up quite considerably. Now, before I go any further, just to let you know what uh, what we're assuming on this front, we had been assuming. Uh, that a vast majority of the U.S. population would be uh, vaccinated by uh, the middle of June or so and something like September uh, here in Canada. Just yesterday, though, President Biden indicated that the, uh, the timeline is that for every adult in the U.S., a vaccine will be available by the end of May. So the timeline is actually being pushed forward. And if the U.S. In does have that many vaccines by May, uh, you know, there could be some extra supply for Canada and uh, we, we could see the, uh, the Canadian time uh, frame pushed, uh, pushed forward as well. So I believe that the, uh, the situation on that front is going to change and potentially dramatically so in the, uh, in the, in the weeks ahead. Now, speaking of President Biden, uh, just before I move into the uh, the economic outlook, uh, we do have to address some of the uh, potential changes as a result of the uh, the complete change in the administration. And you know, arguably, the, one of the most important events this year was was not the riot on on Capitol Hill, but something else that happened in that same 24 hours, and that was the Democrats taking the Senate uh, because of their their victories in in Georgia. That really did change. The fiscal policy landscape, because by giving the Democrats control of the Senate, uh, Biden was then able to uh, propose this very aggressive 1.9 trillion stimulus package, which is currently working its way through Congress. And while you know the end result may not be exactly that 1.9 trillion, it does look like the lion's share of that stimulus will make its uh, its its way through, and that that will give the U.S. economy quite a lift. Now there you know there are a number of other concerns that we're dealing with here uh, with the new administration here in Canada, such as on the Buy America side. But I think the single most important factor of the Biden administration may well be this massive stimulus package that they're looking at. You know, if the U.S. Uh, uh, is looking at very strong growth over, over the next year, uh, that will naturally pull the, uh, the Canadian economy along for the ride to, uh, to a great extent. Now, turning to, uh, to financial markets, you know, COVID may not be through with us, uh, but the financial markets are through with COVID. Uh, you know, they're looking out 6, 12, 18 months down the line. They're looking way beyond the pandemic. And it's not just the equity market. Of course, the equity market famously has recouped all the losses that we saw in the five-week uh, bear market that we had last February and March. Uh, it's not just the S&P 500. It's certainly not just tech stocks. We're seeing global equity markets uh, hitting record highs in, in recent weeks. Even a market as diverse as the Japanese uh, equity market, it's it's recently got to its highest level in 30 years in uh, in recent weeks. And even with the correction, that uh, the small correction that we've seen over the last week or so, the S&P 500 and the, uh, the, the TSX are both within one to two percentage points of all-time highs. But I would stress, it's not just the equity market that is uh, signaling strong growth in the year ahead. If we look at the corporate debt market, uh, corporations uh, were paying a lot more temporarily dur during the market turmoil uh, last March and April. But uh, that, those corporate spreads have actually come all the way back down to they're, they're lower than they were before the pandemic began. Uh, and we often look at that as a, as a real guide in terms of where the market sees the economy going. But perhaps the most interesting comeback is one that I haven't charted here, and that's commodity prices generally. Almost every major commodity that we watch is now completely recouped its losses that it saw last year. Oil was actually one of the last commodities uh, to get back to pre-pandemic levels. In fact, a number of commodities are at you know decade highs or even record highs, like lumber, like copper, and those are very economically sensitive commodities. And so, essentially, the market or the message we're getting from financial markets right across the board is that they are looking at a relatively robust global and North American economic recovery over the next 12 and 24 months. Now, so let's get down to some numbers on, on the global economy. Um, first of all, starting off with last year, no question, last year was uh, one of the deepest downturns that we've seen. In the post-war era, we think that this will go down as the, the deepest single year decline for the global economy last year. And you can see that US and Canada are pretty much middle of the pack in terms of uh, who got hit the hardest last year. Uh, the Asian economies are generally, were a little bit less hard hit. Uh, the European economies were, were a bit harder hit. Um, 
But I think the big story here is the kind of recovery that we're looking at in 2021. While every economy last year went through a recession, we think almost every economy in the world will be looking at a robust recovery in 21 and 22. Globally, we think global growth is going to hit almost 6% this year and be close to 5% next year. Just to put all these numbers into perspective, a normal year for the global economy would be growth of around 3% or something close to what we saw in 2019. So both this year and next year will be well above average. Now, if you know we, we average out uh, the three years of 2020 out to 2022, we're still going to be a little bit less than what would have been normal for the global economy. Um, but we may well surprise to the high side uh, in 21 and 22 uh, as, as we look ahead. And again, I think the important message here is we, we do see firm growth pretty much right around the world uh, this, uh, this year. Uh, turning to North America, as I indicated at the outset, just yesterday, we revised up our Canadian forecast. There were three main reasons for that upgrade. First and foremost, uh, the starting point was much better than we expected. We just learned the official uh, numbers for the uh, for the fourth quarter. The Canadian economy did much, much better in the fourth quarter than almost anyone expected, growing at almost a 10% annual rate in that, uh, that fourth quarter. Just to put that in perspective, the U.S. economy was growing at about a 4% rate in that quarter, and Europe actually saw a decline uh, during the fourth quarter. And the early read on the month of January, in the very heart of the second wave, when we were still seeing pretty intense restrictions, especially in Ontario and Quebec, we still had schools closed in some jurisdictions, the economy still managed to grow in January. So that was a much better starting point than most expected. Second main reason for the upgrade is, well, we upgraded our U.S. forecast a few weeks ago uh, because of the prospects for the Biden stimulus. And the third reason why we've upgraded the Canadian forecast is just the sustained strength we're seeing commodity markets right around the board. That is leading to real activity. That is leading uh, to solid growth, especially in the commodity producing uh, regions of the country. And that's strength in uh, in the resource sector and the strength we've seen in the housing market are offsetting uh, the weakness that we've seen in, say, areas like uh, like re uh, retail sales. So overall, we, we're, we're expecting the Canadian economy to grow by 6% this year. We're expecting the U.S. economy to grow by roughly 6% as well. Uh, if, if we're right on Canada, that would actually mark the single best year for the Canadian economy since 1974. For the U.S., it would be the best since 1984. So we're talking many, many decades since we've seen 6% growth in either economy. Now, of course, it does follow the deepest downturn in a year that we've seen in the post-war era. So this will really be just reversing uh, or beginning to reverse the damage that we uh, we saw last year. Uh, we, we do see uh, some of that strong growth carrying on into 2022. And so we think that by the end of 2022, things will be fairly close to normal. Of course, it will still very much depend on specific industries, specific sectors, but we do see the economy getting pretty close to something like uh, uh, normal by, uh, by next year. Now, just as in the global economy, every single global economy, every single nation was hit with a recession last year, all 10 provinces saw a downturn last year. All 10 provinces were dealing with a recession, but there were differences. And essentially, the two big determinants of how provinces did relative to each other is one, did the province produce oil? Two, how hard was the province hit by the uh, the virus? And, the, you know, the, the provinces that suffered the, the deepest downturn last year were the big oil producers, Alberta and Newfoundland. And next in line were Ontario and Quebec, which were dealing with some of the uh, the toughest uh, cases um, with, with with the virus. Now, looking into 2021, it's not exactly the mirror image of 2020, but it's pretty close. So in other words, some of the provinces that were hit hardest last year, we'll see some of the best rebounds this year. Some of the provinces that fared relatively well last year, like especially the Maritimes, we'll see a little bit of a less of a bounce just because they have a, a shallower hole from which they're they're digging out of in, in 2021. So in some ways, it's it's pretty close to being the mirror image. Uh, you can see Ontario and Quebec, we're, we're looking at pretty firm recoveries in, uh, in 2021 after a, a challenging year last year. Now, given that, uh, that very deep downdraft we saw in both the U.S. and the Canadian economy and the global economy in 2020, of course, we also saw just a terrible deterioration in job markets everywhere last year. Now, the good news is, is after those, you know, double-digit jobless rates that we saw in the spring, 
we have seen unemployment rates come down and come down pretty heavily uh, from those horrific situations last uh, last spring, but we've still got a way to go. And even with our relatively robust growth outlook that we're expecting in both Canada and the US over the next couple of years, we think the job market will be one of the last areas to get back to normal. And when you think about it, the sectors that have been most directly affected by the pandemic, things like restaurants and bars and, and travel and entertainment, those sectors, they may not be the highest wage sectors, they may not be the highest productivity sectors, but they do hire a lot of people. Oftentimes it's part-time jobs. It may be relatively low wage jobs, even minimum wage jobs, but a lot of people are employed in those sectors. And that's why the unemployment rate here in Canada ticked up so much in January because so many people lost part-time jobs during, uh, during the month. And, you know, unless until those sectors are, are back to normal, it's going to be a struggle to get the labor market, market all the way back to, the, to normal. Now, the reason why this really matters for policy is I think, you know, both whether it's central banks or governments, they've been extraordinarily clear that they're going to keep the fiscal taps or the stimulus taps relatively open until they see the job market fully recovering. So, you know, it'll be nice to get GDP and it'll be nice to get spending uh, back to pre-pandemic levels. But unless and until the job market is back to full health, uh, we think that stim uh, uh, policy will remain relatively stimulus for, uh, for quite some time to come. Now, even with that deterioration that we saw in job markets in both Canada and the U.S., one of the truly unique features of this recession and this cycle more generally, and there were a lot of really weird things, frankly, about the, uh, the economy over the past year, but one of the really unique aspects of this cycle is the behavior of household income. Normally in a recession, you see an outright decline in household income. You know, as people are working fewer hours, perhaps they get laid off, you know, small businesses are taking in less money. Well, this time, not only did incomes not fall, they actually accelerated. And just yesterday, we got the, uh, the full year numbers for 2020. And what they showed is that disposable personal income, so this is the take-home pay in, in Canada, actually rose by almost 10% last year. That was the biggest annual increase in personal incomes that we've seen in almost 40 years. Uh, not to put use the technical term, but that's just weird to see household incomes that strong. And the flip side of that is we were having this strength in personal incomes at the same time as people were constrained in, what, in terms of what they could spend on. Sure, they could spend on goods, but in a lot of cases, they couldn't spend on services. You know, it was tough to go to a restaurant and some Times it wasn't wasn't even possible. It was challenging to go on a, on a trip, to say the least. Uh, so people were constrained in terms of what they could spend. So this wedge between strong incomes on the one side and constrained spending on the other side just led to an explosion of personal savings. Before this all began, the average Canadian household was saving about one and a half dollars for every hundred dollars they were taking home in in take home pay. Well, during the the height of the uh, the, the shutdowns last spring, people were saving almost thirty dollars of every hundred dollars. Now it's come down a bit, but even as we speak, the average Canadian household is is still saving more than ten dollars, or the savings rate is still above ten percent, way above pre pandemic levels. And we estimate that Canadian households as a whole saved almost an extra $200 billion last year above and beyond what they would normally save. Now, there's two ways to look at this. One is either households have really repaired their balance sheets overall, and I think that's a big part of it. And the other way to look at it is there is just this mass of potential spending power sitting on the sidelines, which I do think some of it will ultimately get spent when and when households are able to begin spending again. So, you know, my key message to policymakers has been they really don't have to do that much other than to get the vaccine out there. When people are able to spend again, uh, they certainly, we think, will be spending again. Now, another very unusual feature of this cycle is normally during a recession, you get a big upswing in bankruptcies, you know, whether it's consumer bankruptcies or business bankruptcies, that didn't happen this time. You know, and there's no mystery what's going on here. A lot of it is because of that very heavy duty government support, especially at the household level. Um, consumer bankruptcies actually fell. Now, of course, they were also helped uh, by the fact that interest rates plunged. Uh, banks did defer mortgages for, uh, for a number of months. That helped forestall a lot of serious damage. But the, you know, the big story is even in recent months, consumer bankruptcies are still down 35% from a year ago because of this very heavy duty government support. I'm a little less convinced about the 
business, uh, the big decline in business bankruptcies. I think businesses are hanging on, uh, waiting to, to, you know, to see exactly how the landscape shakes out. We may well see an uptick in business bankruptcies over, over the next year. But even there, that's a very, very unusual feature of this, uh, this recession that we actually saw an outright decline in, uh, in business bankruptcies last, uh, last year. Now, of course, the counterpoint to all this, you know, how, how did we have such tremendous, you know, such a tremendous buildup of household savings and, you know, how did we forestall uh, all these bankruptcies? Well, the flip side of this is we saw just this horrendous deterioration in government uh, budget deficits. And this certainly was not a story that was particular to Canada. We saw it right around the world, but Canada was right up there. We were, you know, arguably as aggressive as anybody in helping to support the economy. If you go back a year ago, Ottawa thought their budget deficit for the fiscal year that just about to end at the end of this month, they thought it was going to be about $30 billion. Now they think it's going to be close to $400 billion. At least that was the last official estimate late last year. We actually think at the end of the day, it's probably going to be a little bit smaller than that because the economy did a little bit better than expected, but it's still going to be well north of $300 billion, the likes of which we have never seen before. And I have to tell you, one of the you know most common questions I get is, how are we going to pay for this? Well, some of it you know, will be paid for just a one time and hopefully it's only a one time big step up in Ottawa's debt to, to GDP. We think much of this deficit will roll off naturally as the economy reopens again and, you know, people are back to work, earning revenues and, and paying uh, income taxes again. We think uh, and, and a lot of the programs can uh, can naturally roll off without any damage. But I think the really key thing to watch here is just how quickly does the deficit come down as the economy recovers? And are there a bunch of spending programs that really get locked in on a longer term basis? And to me, you know, that's when we really have to get, you know, start talking about how do, how do we pay for this if we're left with a sustained budget deficit, you know, at, even after the economy recovers, then I think the conversation will turn more fully uh, to, to how do we pay for this over, over the medium term. Now, of course, it wasn't just governments that were, you know, rushing out the door uh, to help support the economy, uh, monetary policy, uh, central banks. You know, the one lesson they learned from the last crisis is when you know you're in a crisis, it makes no sense to wait around and to hold ammunition in reserve. Basically, you know, bring out everything immediately. And that's exactly what the Bank of Canada and certainly the Federal Reserve did. Uh, they got very aggressive very quickly. Both of them basically almost emptied their toolbox uh, last uh, last March, taking rates right down to zero, almost uh, almost or almost zero, uh, and nearly immediately, uh, the Bank of Canada for the first time ever embarked on quantitative easing. And even as we speak, they're still buying $4 billion worth of government bonds each and every week. That's $200 billion a year. Uh, that's almost financing the budget deficit all by themselves. Now we have seen longer term interest rates, which the uh, central banks can't control, uh, rise and rise pretty aggressively in recent weeks. Uh, it was the uh, the big uh, talk in the markets uh, last week. We, we saw conditions calm a little bit at the start of this week. But I think the underlying trend is still towards higher interest rates. And there's uh, for these these uh, longer term yields, you know, when we look at, say, 10 year government bond yields or 30 year government bond yields, our, our official view is that we think the market's got a little bit ahead of itself last week. But the underlying trend will be a higher grind over the uh, the next 18 to 24 months. And there's only uh, a limited extent to which central banks can really control those uh, those interest rates. And I do I do see the risk to our forecast is cl pretty clearly being the upside. Now, those are the longer term interest rates, the short term interest rates, you know, the things that drive variable mortgage rates and prime lending rates. That's pretty directly controlled by the central banks. And we see the central banks being incredibly patient here. Um, they have very clearly signaled, whether it's the Federal Reserve or the Bank of Canada, that they're going to be extraordinarily patient here. Uh, they are not going to raise interest rates precipitously. Uh, I, our, our official view is that neither the Fed or the Bank of Canada will raise uh, their short-term interest rates until mid-2023. If it's earlier than that, that's actually good news because that means the economy is wildly outperformed. You know, that means absolutely everything has gone right and we actually do have a little bit of up upside potential on inflation, uh, but certainly a lot of upside potential on growth if the central banks are actually raising rates before 2023. Uh, but again, they can't completely control those longer term interest rates. And we got a whiff of the kind of upward pressure we can see on some of those longer term interest rates uh, in last week's action.
Now that that all brings us to the discussion of inflation, and and I have to say this is one of the more common questions or concerns I've been getting from uh, from all kinds of folks. Um, you know, are, are we not risking an inflation episode here as a result of this incredible amount of stimulus that we're, we're seeing? You know, whether it's the bond buying by central banks or the massive budget deficits we're rising, and we're seeing some cases of real life inflation. You know, whether it's in some resource prices or you know, and we're seeing bottlenecks beginning to build up in in various industries. You know, we've uh, you've probably all read about the, uh, the the computer chip shortages that we've been dealing with. Even container ships are you know now starting to see real pricing power because of uh, potential bottlenecks. And I will tell you, frankly, we are going in the months ahead, we are going to see some pretty impressively high inflation readings. Part of it is just com it's going to compare, uh, be compared with the extreme conditions of, of last year when prices really fell out of bed in the early days of, of the pandemic. It's also going to be driven by some of these uh, short term pressures, bottlenecks that we're seeing. And some of it's going to be driven uh, by the backup in, uh, in oil prices that we've seen in, uh, in recent weeks. So headline inflation, while it's been you know, reading around 1% in uh, in recent months in Canada and the U.S., uh, for a short spell of time, those headline readings might get to 3% or even close to 4% in the U.S. over the springtime. Now, the Bank of Canada and the Federal Reserve are well aware uh, that we could get some temporary increases in inflation. But the big question is, is are those readings sustained? You know, what happens when we get later into the year, does it lead to higher wages as well? Does it broaden out uh, to services prices as well? Our view is it probably doesn't, and that inflation ultimately settles in around 2% or perhaps a little bit higher uh, for a spell. And that's even that's a big change uh, from where we were before this. You know, it was very tough to get inflation above 2% before the, uh, the pandemic. Um, but our, our view is that inflation will ultimately settle in close to 2% or a little bit higher. And I still think when you're doing your medium term planning, uh, that's, that's a pretty consistent uh, or a pretty reasonable anchor to build your medium term expectations or plans on and would be average 2% inflation. But I will frankly tell you that the high side risk to inflation are greater now than I've seen in quite some time, and we cannot readily dismiss those uh, those risks at that that time. And, and I have to say, personally, that's one of the bigger surprises uh, that's come out of this pandemic than uh, what we were expecting, say, a year ago. Is you know, in the early stages of the pandemic, everyone believed that you know uh, the pandemic was going to you know possibly lead to deflation. There was a lot of talk about the possibility of negative interest rates. Almost no one's talking about deflation now. Almost no one's talking about the possibility of negative interest rates. Uh, now, you know, now the uh, the concern has clearly uh, turned to the possibility of a little bit of inflation over the uh, the next couple of years. Now, one and speaking of surprises, uh, one area where we have seen very real inflation has been just the remarkable comeback in the housing sector in, in Canada. And by the way, the U.S. is doing something similar to what we're seeing in Canada, but we had a huge head start on uh, on the U.S. This is way beyond a V-shaped recovery, what we've seen. You know, not only have we recouped the losses last April and May, we're way beyond pre-pandemic levels, whether you look at, you know, prices or sales or even construction activity. Uh, we just saw a report on building permits for the month of January. They're at an all-time high driven by residential permits permits in the month of January. Uh, that chart on the right, I call that my uh, CFL or Canadian Football League chart. It's the nine cities in the CFL. It's the change in existing prices over the last 12 months. Um, the shape of that chart is very similar to what it was a year ago. It's you know basically the same order among the cities. The big difference is everybody's taken a big step to the right. So in other words, the cities that were weak a year ago, like Edmond and Calgary, have actually strengthened. And we've had a preliminary reading on February uh, results in Calgary. And even there, we're starting to see sales really get strong. We're starting to see prices beginning to rise, even in a market that was as hard hit as Calgary. Meanwhile, the, the cities that were strong before are now incredibly strong. You know, places like Hamilton, Ottawa, and Montreal. Toronto is actually pretty average. They're a pretty average city right now. Now, I admit the level isn't average. We just got a report uh, this morning that the average home price in Toronto has eclipsed a million dollars for the uh, for the first time uh, ever. But in terms of you know sales increases or price increases, Toronto is pretty typical. The real strength are the outlier cities around the big, uh, the, the larger urban centers right now. You know, just to give you some examples, places like Barrie and Guelph and London, Ontario, are seeing gains of 30 or 40 percent in prices right now. 
Policymakers are starting to get concerned about this, but the reality is there's not much they can do about it. Frankly, the Bank of Canada is not going to raise interest rates at this stage of the cycle, not when the unemployment rate is still above 9%. They might start to jawbone or try to talk down the market a little bit more aggressively, but the reality is there's not a whole lot that policymakers can do about the uh, the hot housing market at this point. So, you know, the bottom line is we remain relatively constructive on housing. And we think, you know, the one thing that can bring the housing market to, to heal or to cool it would be an increase in interest rates. And frankly, as I said, the Bank of Canada doesn't sound like they're going to do much, at least with the uh, the rates that they can control. One other topic I, I did want to touch on uh, just before we turn to Q&A uh, was uh, the Canadian dollar. Mu you know, much like every other financial market, it was walloped uh, during the crisis uh, a year ago, but it reversed those losses relatively quickly. It's now actually higher uh, than it was before the pandemic began. A lot of this just reflects the uh, the comeback that we've seen in uh, commodity prices and oil prices uh, specifically. It's also been driven a lot by the pullback in the U.S. dollar more broadly. And I'll have to tell you, over the long haul, the single biggest driver for the Canadian dollar over the uh, the long term is the direction of the U.S. dollar itself against everyone else. So in other words, when the U.S. dollar is strong, the Canadian dollar tends to be weak with everyone else. And when the U.S. dollar weakens, as it has over the last 10 months or so, uh, the Canadian dollar tends to strengthen. Now, one interesting um, item to note is since the start of 2021, we've actually seen the U.S. dollar find a little bit of a better footing. Um, if you look at the U.S. dollar against a basket of currencies, it's actually strengthened a little bit since the start of this year. And some of that just reflects the relatively better outlook for the U.S. economy um, versus, say, a Europe or a Japan uh, than would have been the case a couple months ago. So I think the U.S. dollar may have found a little bit of a, better of a footing. So the flip side of that is we don't see a whole lot further strength in the Canadian dollar. On balance, we do think there are enough positives out there, like a better global economy, relatively firm oil prices, uh, to like you know to keep us a bit constructive on the Canadian dollar. We see it getting um, uh, averaging eighty cents or even a little bit higher over over the next year, but we don't see a really big further gain in the in the Canadian dollar. If you were to ask me about you know where do I see the Canadian dollar five to ten years down the line, I'm a little bit more concerned about some of the competitiveness challenges that uh, that Canada faces over the medium and longer term. So I wouldn't be quite as bullish as 80 cents over the medium term, I'd, I'd peg fair value a bit lower uh, than 80 cents if, if we were to get out to, uh, to, to five to 10 years down uh, down the line. Just the very last slide I'll, I'll leave before we uh, turn to Q&A is, you know, ultimately when when we look out uh, over, over the next uh, year or so is, you know, ult ultimately the, the sectors that were directly affected by the pandemic, you know, things like air travel, uh, hotels, arts and entertainment, restaurants and bars. These are the sectors that make up about 4% of the Canadian economy, unless and until they're completely able or almost completely able to operate normally, we're not going to have a complete recovery. We're not going to have a complete recovery in jobs. Uh, we think that will take a, a more complete rollout of the vaccine. But as I said, at, at early on, it does look like the uh, news on that front is improving and improving rapidly. And we may be bringing for, forward the day at which the economy actually can get back to normal. And that's really the best thing that policymakers are the biggest single contribution uh, that policymakers can make at this time to uh, to get the recovery really going. Uh, that's it for the formal part of the presentation. I'd uh, like to invite uh, Rob, uh, hopefully now in, to, uh, to join us uh, to uh, conduct the Q&A. Hi, Rob. Good morning, Doug, and, and thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, uh, across the eastern portion of the country. Great insights, Doug. I always appreciate uh, listening to your insights and learning. Makes me wish I would have paid attention more in macroeconomics class. So we, we have had some some questions come in, and a, a lot of them obviously are related to uh, obviously the pandemic and the vaccines. But I guess the question beyond herd immunity and the anti-vaccinations, what headwinds do you see for the Canadian economy in you know the next twelve months? What what could go wrong besides the vaccines? What do you see? Well, it's interesting when you when you think back to what were the concerns before the pandemic, and I remember being asked this question about a year ago. You know, what else would we ta we be talking about if we weren't talking about uh, coronavirus? Um, you know, if you recall, the number one concern for the Canadian economy was the uh, was the level of of household debt and the uh, vulnerability on that, that side. Now, one, um, you know, as, as, as much as anything has, has been positive from uh, 
from this whole very unfortunate episode is because of the tremendous transfers to the household sector from uh, governments. Household finances overall have actually strengthened as a result of this. But I am concerned about this, um, this, this incredible strength we've seen in the housing market and just the risk that the household sector uh, as a whole, will be overdoing it again, and you know, increasing uh, their vulnerability by you know, crank, you know, just cranking up home prices and uh, and beginning to uh, to build debt levels again. You know, it does leave them vulnerable if those uh, if those longer term interest rates uh, do begin to back up over the next couple of years. Of course, the other big vulnerability, um, you know, more broadly on the debt side, is got you know, governments everywhere, as I said, but especially here in Canada, have, have built up a lot of debt in the last year. And that too leaves them fairly vulnerable if interest rates, if long-term interest rates were to back up fairly aggressively in the next year. Uh, the other thing I would point to is more generally, uh, the other the other concern, of course, we were dealing with over the last couple of years ahead of the pandemic was, uh, you know, was trade frictions. You know, of course, we had our very own episode of that here uh, with the renegotiation of the USMCA that seemed to put us in the, in the clear for a while. We we think under Biden, um, trade policy will probably be a little bit more predictable, a little less dramatic, but it doesn't mean it's going to be less protectionist. Uh, you know, of course, historically, the Democrats have actually been more protectionist than the Republicans. You know, uh, one of the main planks of Biden's policy has been buy America. We're still, you know, waiting to see if Canada can get some sort of semi uh, pass on on that front. I don't, I don't think we are going to get a full pass. Uh, so we're going to face a little bit of protectionism as well. And, you know, more generally, uh, when we look out globally, I, th- I, I think we could be faced with a lot of, uh, a lot of protectionist forces uh, because a lot of economies will be doing their best. Uh, to, to doing their own version of Buy America and making sure that their own economies can uh, can really get back on on their two feet. So I'd I'd see those uh, those two issues, you know, rebuilding of household debt and uh, and potential protectionism. You know, much much as uh, those were the two of the biggest concerns we were facing before the pandemic, I don't think either one has really gone away as uh, as an underlying risk for uh, for the Canadian economy. Perfect. Thank you. I've got a related question that. You talked about the demand for residential housing and the uptick. What about the urban centers and, and the office and industrial properties with a, uh, you know, a migration to smaller towns or the suburbs? What do you see sort of hitting, you know, big city North America? So good, timely question. Um, it just so happened that happens that our department, one of my colleagues, uh, Robert Kavsek, just uh, put out a a report in last week's uh, focus and by the way you can get any of our publications just by uh, going uh, going to our website you don't need a password uh, to get on there um, but he just did a publication last friday on uh, on the outlook for uh, for urban centers over over the medium term uh, you know there's been a lot of concern you know whether it's uh, you know uh, a number of large corporations uh, reducing their their office footprint, uh, you know this this uh, talk about you know people moving to the suburbs or the exurbs or or smaller uh, uh, smaller cities uh, getting out of the big city. You know whether we're going to have a hollowing out of of downtown cores. Our our main uh, our our main conclusion was that this. Uh, this is not likely to be the case that we're going to have a hollow, we're we're not going to have a hollowing out of of the urban cores. We we actually think that uh, cities will continue to ultimately drive the the Canadian economy. Um, yes, in some cases, people will choose uh, to relocate to the suburbs or even smaller cities, but we don't you, you know we don't think this is is really going to cripple uh, the big urban centers. Uh, you know, keep keep. Keep in mind that uh, office markets in in some cities like Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal were as healthy or as tight as we had ever seen them before the pandemic began. Um, vacancy rates were incredibly low. Rental vacancy rates, you know, whether you're talking about residential or office, were just scorchingly low um, in many of the cities. That wasn't the case in Calgary; quite the opposite. Um, but in in most other major cities. You know, it, it was a case of there wasn't enough supply. Now, of course, the situation has changed in the last 12 months. But we think, you know, if you look out three to five years, it may not be that different. Um, I'm always I'm always cautious about, you know, suggesting that some of the changes we've seen in the last year will become permanent. Um, I, certainly, a lot of uh, big corporations will look at ways to somewhat reduce their, their office footprint. But, you know, uh, it, it, it could lead to some repricing in office space. But I think what you're going to see is, uh, 
uh, you know, other, other, others will upgrade their space. You know, where, where the pressure will really land will be on us uh, uh, below grade A uh, office space. You know, f f uh, so someone will, you know, seek to move into that 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 better space. And and ultimately, while the, while they're, you know, they're, they're, it will be an adjustment process. I I, I suspect the downtown cores will uh, will largely uh, reemerge as 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 robust. Um, you know, pricing won't be as aggressive as it was before the pandemic, uh, but ultimately, I, I do think the urban centers will reemerge uh, in relatively healthy form when uh, when the dust settles on this very unfortunate episode. Perfect. That's that's great news. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could take me. I'm sitting in downtown Toronto. Wonder if you could take me sort of east and you know look at the economies of Atlantic Canada, Quebec, and Ontario, and, and talk about you know present situation maybe drop down a level. I know you talked about the effects of COVID and the projections for you know GDP or CPI, but I wonder if you can talk about those any particular keys in any of those regions that uh, you can see in your uh, crystal ball right now. Okay, and, uh, and I'll start off with uh, with Ontario and Quebec because I think the, the story there is relatively straightforward. Um, you know, of course, uh, with such a weight in, in the Canadian economy, um, you know, naturally, they're not going to deviate that much from the national averages I gave. And, and in many respects, Ontario and Quebec were, were fairly close to being, quote, typical in, insofar as there was a typical province. Each, each had, uh, especially Quebec, had maybe a, a little more negative experience with, with, the, uh, with the virus. Um, you know, while Ontario and Quebec have had you know, different episodes, um, you know, slightly different waves, uh, slightly different restrictions, slightly different measures. Ultimately, Ontario and Quebec will, you know, will have seen relatively similar economic outcomes both last year and, and uh, in, in 2021. Both a little bit more negative than average last year, probably setting up a little bit more of a bounce back than uh, than average in in 2021 but i think you know for both for both it's a, it's a relatively straightforward case and syncs up fairly fairly well with the with the national picture i presented atlanta can a very different story let's start with the three maritime provinces in other words atlanta can to x uh, x newfoundland and you know there i think the story was was relatively positive in 2020 and and, it, and it's a straightforward case uh, they, they they just had a much more or a much less negative experience with the with the virus than just about everyone uh, else. You know, we, we we saw, you know, sporadic outbreaks in, in New Brunswick just recently. PEI has been uh, dealing with a bit of an outbreak, but relative to the rest of the country, very, very, you know, much more limited uh, number of cases. Um, and, you know, I, I was actually... Uh, just speaking with the Nova Scotia, the new Nova Scotia Premier last uh, last week, and we were, you know, talking about uh, how Nova Scotia was very much an outlier versus the rest, much of the rest of the country, and uh, you know how conditions were very different in Nova Scotia, and how it was able to remain uh, much more open than most of the rest of the economy, and as a result of that, a very direct result, uh, those economies went through a much less fierce downturn than much of the rest of the country. So it actually wasn't that different from what we saw in 2009, which was a serious recession. But in much of the rest of the country, uh, this year, this uh, past year was a much deeper, deeper downturn downturn than what we saw back in in uh, in 2009. So by the same token, just as the drop wasn't as deep in those uh, regions, the the rebound will be a little less vigorous over over the uh, the, the next year as uh, as 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 well. Now, you know, the, the, the one uh, positive, um, you know, certainly these, these economies aren't as dependent on, on resources as they may have been in the past, but they're still relatively resource dependent on, uh, you know, if you compare it to, say, a place like on Ontario. And the fact that commodity prices, especially uh, forced product prices in particular, and some metals prices have come back and come back so aggressively, is is a net positive uh, for uh, for the region as as a whole? Um, overall, we remain relatively constructive on on the maritime provinces this year. This year, uh, we just don't think the uh, the bounce will be quite as big because the hole wasn't as deep. Newfoundland is is a special case uh, again. Of course, it's had its own unique episode with the uh, with the virus, especially uh, recently. It depends a bit more, perhaps, on tourism. It definitely depends more on oil than some of the other provinces. Um, that led to the much deeper drop in uh, in uh, GDP last year in Newfoundland than the other Atlantic provinces and one of the deepest drops that we saw in the country. Um, because of the uh, the new outbreak recently in Newfoundland, uh, we're, we're probably not going to get quite the bounce uh, that we're going to see in some of the other provinces. 
but ultimately we do think uh, Newfoundland can uh, can come back just simply because they uh, they did see the you know one of the more uh, fearsome declines over the the past year the one longer term concern I do have about Newfoundland and this is more so than the case in the other Atlantic provinces is just the fiscal situation uh, the fiscal straits uh, that Newfoundland does find itself in I think will restrain growth in the province over over the medium term every you know pretty much every province in the country does face a bit of a fiscal challenge it tends to build as you head east over over the country it's not perfectly that way it you know it's it doesn't line up exactly geographically but generally speaking bc is in the best fiscal case and i i would argue that newfoundland is arguably in the worst fiscal shape uh, from a long-term perspective and that will constrain its growth rate over over the medium term Hopefully that answers the uh, the question. Perfect, thank you. It's, it's nice to get a little bit of a more drop down view. Um, on that theme, one of the questions is how much of economic stability is government stimulus or bailout based and what happens when that stops and what are the effects when that stops? Good question. And, and I think, uh, you know, a fair point to, to be made is, um, and, and just in recent days, a lot of people have been questioning the degree of uh, the stimulus support that we saw in Canada, you know, especially with uh, with that relatively firm performance of the economy right around the turn of the year more broadly. Um, but I, I think it's a fair point to make that given the kind of restrictions and lockdowns we saw last year and, and you know, even the, the more moderate restrictions we saw around the turn of the year, if we had not had uh, heavy duty fiscal stimulus, we probably would have been looking at just a, a, a horrible, you know, an even more horrible economic environment than what we did go through um, over over the past year. You know, some people have talked about, you know, the likes of the Great Depression. I think that's exaggerating a little bit because the Great Depression lasted 10 years. But I think in, in terms of the potential depth of the decline, it could have rivaled, you know, what we saw back in in the early 30s if if we didn't get the kind of government support policies that we saw uh, over the last year. Having said all that, I, th I think it's fair to question, you know, did did the government do a bit too much? You know, was was it not, you know, perhaps as well targeted as it could have been? And I think that's that's fair game. Clearly, Ottawa uh, valued speed over um, targeting or you know, carefulness and in, in, in the way they rolled things out last year, maybe that was the right answer. Maybe it was it was correct to err on the side of generosity. But I think as the economy recovers, they really have to do they really have to fine tune uh, that stimulus when when we look ahead or that that support when we look ahead. I know there is a lot of concern. You know, is is the economy going to freeze up? You know, when when the stimulus is removed, that, that's that's not the way I see it. Think think of it as. Basically, that spending replaced activity that wasn't able to happen. You know, when when businesses were told to shut down, when people were told to stay home and not spend money, basically incomes had to be supported by government policy. When the economy is able to open up uh, more completely, when people are able to get out and spend again, there's just not going to be the need for that kind of support. It's going to naturally roll off. So I'm not particularly concerned that these policies will, uh, you know, will roll off and that's immediately going to lead uh, to a pullback in the economy. You know, frankly, if, if Ottawa is going to make a mistake, it's that they stay too generous too long. I think that's the bigger risk, you know, that they're going to build in uh, perennial deficits or, you know, build in these huge spending programs. I actually think that's the much bigger risk that we face than Ottawa, you know, closing the spending taps too early and, and leading to a downturn in the economy. I think that's the, frankly, I think that's the last thing we, we should be worried about. Um, you know, I, I, I can't tell you how many times the Prime Minister has said in so many words that we've got your back. And, uh, you know, I think that's basically code for we're just not going to turn the taps off until the economy is completely recovered. So one of the questions is, when do you think the economy is completely recovered? When, when do we get back to, I guess, what looks and smells like the new normal? How long is it going to take? Yeah, and, and, and of course, that's, that's a question that's a little bit above an economist's pay grade because it really is driven by what happens on the health side. But, I'll, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you our, our best um, you know our best view on on that. I, I you know and, and let's face it with with the the variants. Uh, you know I can't tell you how many times we've heard health officials warning us about the uh, the, the new variants. So there there could be another another wave before the vaccines are rolled out uh, more more fully. 
But as we've seen in recent months, you know, clearly the economy was able to deal with that better than uh, it was able to deal with the second wave better than I think most uh, most expected. So I'm not sure that completely changes the uh, the economic outlook. And in in recent days, there certainly has been better news globally on vaccines. You know, we've got new vaccines being approved. We've got a lot of companies really beginning to to ramp up production. You know, we just heard last night Merck is going to help J and J and J and J is a one shot vaccine uh, that would certainly uh, accelerate things if uh, you know if we get a lot of production of of the j and j vaccine uh, for instance um, once once the vaccine really does get uh, rolled out in a, in a much more significant fashion that does get us on the path a lot more quickly of getting back to normal it's going to take time though you know I think you know how how long is it before your your local restaurant that may have shut down you know somebody else steps into that space and or, or reopens it again you know how long is it before we're you know allowed to go see the maple leafs again how long is it you know before we're going to be able to travel within canada let alone uh, abroad again you know a lot of that's for policymakers to decide and you know exactly how long it takes the vaccine to get rolled out but i suspect that we will be close to something like normality by 2022 and you know in terms of a full recovery in the job market i th- i think we'll be getting close uh, to, to, you know, the second half of uh, 2022. It may come earlier than that. You know, we just heard in the last 24 hours that basically Texas, you know, we can all question the wisdom of this, but Texas and places like uh, Texas and Mississippi are going to completely open up again, you know, in, in, the, in the days ahead. Um, you know, they want to get back to normal too early. Uh, frankly, I think that's that's a big mistake when they're so close to to getting the vaccine. You know, like, why don't you just wait a month or, or so? Uh, but but I think the day to getting back to normal might might be sooner than than many of us have, have expected. Thank you. And that was a question I had about Texas. So I'll make it a little bit broader. How important is it to open up the U.S. border uh, for us in Canada? And sort of what implications has closing it? And when do you think we need to do that to actually help our recovery? So it's very interesting. You know, Canada's actually a net buyer of tourism. You know, yes, the tourism industry is important to Canada, but year in, year out, we run big trade deficits on the tourism sector. You know, whether it's the the snowbirds or, you know, people going to Europe or Asia, we actually spend a lot more money outside of the, uh, the this country than folks coming into the country spend in Canada. So by keeping the borders closed, that money has sort of stayed up, you know, bottled up in, in Canada to, uh, to, to, to some extent. Um, so it's it's not entirely clear cut that uh, allowing people to travel abroad and you know allowing foreigners to come to, to Canada is, is necessarily a clear cut positive for our, for our economy. Uh, I think it's a positive for our mental health. Um, you know, and ultimately, I do think you know in, in terms of getting back to normal, it's it's very important to open the border up again. Um, you know, ultimately for the tourism sector to completely recover, I think we do need the uh, the, the border to open uh, back up again. But it's a bit of a mixed blessing, uh, just just because as I, as I said, we we do have that uh, perennial tourism uh, deficit in Canada. That's certainly not you know not a reason to keep our borders closed by any means. Um, I, I I I I can't guess when you know when uh, the federal government and 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 Washington will de- decide to to open the border. I. I, I think Washington will be keen to open it uh, sooner than, than Canada will be. And who knows? You know, virus cases might come down faster in the U.S. than, than in Canada if they get the uh, the vaccine rolled out in a more expeditious uh, fashion. Best guess is it, it, it will come sometime around, uh, you know, when, when the vaccine has been rolled out to a very significant share of the Canadian population, which I suspect will be in uh, the late summer or, or early fall. It, it may come earlier than that, though. It uh, it, it may well. Uh, but that would be my best guess at this point. Great, thank you. Two two last questions, uh, and I'll save the uh, the simple one for the end. But you you at six percent, your GDP projection seems a little bit more bullish than some others on the street in the last couple of days. Is your crystal ball a little rosier than others, or you can say what what are you seeing differently than uh, perhaps some of your peers on the street? And and one thing I would point out is we're we're not wildly more optimistic than others. You know, six percent sounds like a huge number. It is it is a very big number. Um, heading into yesterday's uh, uh, GDP report, uh, the consensus was actually getting close to uh, and and we were five percent 
uh, growth call before uh, before our revision. Uh, the consensus was actually getting close to our call. The Bank of Canada's official call was for 4% growth this year, and they were one of the more uh, cautious or conservative uh, forecasters out there. I su suspect a lot of other forecasters in the days ahead will be revising up their call. I don't think we're gonna, going to end up uh, being that much of an outlier. I will tell you that, you know, based on where we were in, in, uh, in January, even if there was no growth through the rest of this year, January's level of output was already almost almost 4% higher than last year's average. So we were already starting at a very, you know, we we're already headed for a very strong year for, for growth, uh, even before we almost began this year, simply because, you know, presumably we're not going to be having the, uh, you know, the, the, the almost complete shutdowns of the economy that we had last April. Uh, you know, we're not going to go through that hole this year. So just taking that month out of, you know, out of the equation almost builds in a relatively strong performance by the economy. But, I, you know, as, as I said, I think you're going to see a lot of other forecasters starting to re revise their forecasts in the days ahead. They might not get all the way to, to 6%, but we're relatively uh, comfortable with uh, with our call. We've we've tended to be a little bit more optimistic than others uh, since about last uh, last spring, you know, since the depths of the pandemic. And all I will tell you is the way things have played out, it's it's actually uh, you know tended to lean our way. Things things have been a little less bad than many expected. You know during the depths of the uh, the, the lockdowns last spring. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. One last question because I, I need your help on this one. And the quickest answer I can get out of you is, what economic signals should a guy who got a C in economics pay attention to over the next you know couple of months? What are the three key things that I should look for? in the economy that you can take it away so we can I can watch uh, the national news and feel comfortable as things recover. Well, so first first and foremost, I think is the you know the path of the uh, the virus itself and you know the role of the vaccines, the interplay on the health side is is probably the single most important. I mean, if we really do you know, do get the uh, the the virus, the new virus numbers, you know, heading way down, back close to zero in the months ahead. That's the best possible news that uh, that we can get in terms of the economic outlook over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. It means we can get, uh, you know, closer to normal that that much sooner. On on the economic front, I, I think uh, you know one of the big keys to watch will will be employment. Um, you know how, do, how does the job market fare? That's that's really going to drive policy. Uh, the single, be, you know, there's a lot of moving parts when you hear the uh, the job numbers. I think the single most important to look at is just that good old headline unemployment rate. And before this began, we had an unemployment rate of less less than six percent. I think that's you know where policymakers want to get things back to. In January, the latest month we had, it was a bit above nine percent. So we still got some work to do. Um, the other thing to keep a mind, you know, uh, an, an eye on. Uh, another economic indicator, you know, simply financial markets as, as a whole. I, I think financial markets did a terrific job. You know, they're not always the best for economic forecaster, but I think they did a terrific job of, of, of almost getting this cycle exactly right. You know, what they showed is this precipitous decline early last year. But it came back really quickly, and that's almost exactly what the economy did. It went through this wrenching decline last March and April, and we've been seeing a slow workout uh, by the economy in the in the last uh, the last ten months or so. And so, I think financial markets overall actually will bear watching. You know, don't don't pay too much attention to the day by day by day moves, but look for look for the trend in uh, in the broader equity markets, and even the TSX is you know for all its foibles has not been a bad leading economic indicator for the Canadian economy through this episode. Uh, so I'd, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend that as a pretty simple way uh, to monitor what the economic outlook is like. Perfect, thank you, Doug. And uh, we've come to the end of the time. So first of all, I wanna thank you for your insights. I wanna thank everyone for joining us in this conversation. We are gonna hold more of these sessions uh, to go forward. So please send your thoughts to the, the person that invited you. I hope you all found it uh, valuable. I always learn from Doug, as I said, he economics 101. Your feedback is important to us. So please send your feedback, as I said, to the person that invited you. We'll, uh, we'll make these as best as we can. And my best wishes to everyone to stay healthy, stay safe. Please reach out to uh, anyone at BMO if we can help. BMO.com for all your economic uh, insights. So thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.